Over the past decade, childhood cases of type 2 diabetes have increased tenfold. A third of American children are considered obese or overweight. That's one in three of our children. 10% of health care costs are from obesity-related diseases in America. We're talking about 13-year-old kids who look like 45-year-olds on the inside. And it is truly a medical issue. It isn't an issue of looking good. It's an issue of feeling good. It's an issue of preventing cancer and diabetes and heart disease. And with 80% of adult obesity beginning in childhood, the future is easy to predict and in dire need of preventive measures being taken. It's starting with at something like low self-esteem to early puberty, going on to increased rates of high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Asthma, heart disease, bone and joint problems, type 2 diabetes, leading to heart attack and stroke. The average American now carries 23 extra pounds. Experts call it diabesity. Children in lower income families are twice as likely to become obese. The long-term impact of chronic illnesses stemming from being overweight could crush this country's health care system. It's threatening our families and more importantly, it, it's threatening the future of this nation. The cost of this is killing us. I believe that until we get a hold of our lifestyles and our the food chain and how we eat and how we exercise, uh, we're going to have serious, serious problems. This is the number one public health challenge of the United States today. Isn't that terrifying? Can you imagine this is the first generation that's not going to outlive their parents? My husband and I are both news junkies, and about six years ago, every morning we start our day by reading a bunch of newspapers and having a cup of coffee, and I was reading more and more about this epidemic of childhood obesity, and I couldn't get it out of my mind. And it was one of those impressions, something that comes across, and you just know you're supposed to do about something about it. But at the time, I was busy. Well, I should say I have 11-month-old twins. I thought I was busy. Now I don't know what I did with all my time. Um, so the tipping point for me came when I was taking a tour of a nonprofit in downtown Detroit, and there was a young mom who was maybe 15 or 16 who was coming through, and she was feeding a soda to her newborn in the bottle. I couldn't believe it. And it was terrifying and appalling, but I thought, you know what? It's not her fault. She didn't know better. Nobody had taught her about nutrition, about exercise, how to take care of herself, let alone how to take care of a baby. So that, at that point, that was my tipping point. I knew that I had to do something. So I had never started a nonprofit before, and I wasn't sure how to begin, but I knew I needed to be strategic. So I stepped back. And I came up with what I believe to be a solid foundation. So when I was preparing this foundation, or this um, presentation, and I was outlining it, I came up with an acronym that I hope you'll appreciate. I realized the first step was that I needed to learn how to think Greek. The first step was generating an idea. So the, I, you know, in my experience, in anything that I do, if it's nonprofit, it's before, um, I ventured into this world, I was a video producer and I'd won awards, and I found that in anything that I worked on, the best question that could ever be asked is, what if? So now I'm hearing more and more about this epidemic of childhood obesity, and I know I have to do something about it. I was seeing things that weren't working, I was seeing a lot of bureaucracy, I was seeing a lot of red tape, and I said, what if we start a nonprofit? What if we focus on the mind, body, and spirit? What if we start working with kids from the inside out? What if we just jumped into the, into the city and started working with the kids? So that's what we decided to do. The next step is the R in my thinking Greek, to recruit. And I think for me, this is an important step, again, in anything that I do, if it's personal, professional, even with raising my kids. This is a step where I really have to be honest with myself, and I have to step back. It's at times very humbling, and I have to evaluate my own shortcomings. And I know, as I was approaching this nonprofit, we were working with kids. As far as I was concerned, in anything I do, there's no room for error. But when you're working with kids, there's really no room for error. And I had to be very honest as I was forming this nonprofit about what I did well and where I had some shortcomings. 
For me, I know I'm a big picture person. I know I'm an idea person. I know I can ask, what if? Um, you know, I asked my husband once if he thought I was a rule breaker, and he said, I think you think there are no rules. So I knew I could bring that to the table. I could just push forward. But I know when it comes to administration, that's not my strong suit. I know when it comes to the budgets and going out and asking for funds, that's not my strong suit. So while it might have been fun to start this nonprofit with just a group of friends or cool people that I wanted to hang out with, that wasn't going to be fair to the program. So I built the program very strategically, one key person at a time who really brought something to the table. And while it wasn't critical that the program be started with people that I like, I think that always helps. Because we have a lot of fun, we get together, we collaborate, and that's what I love to do. The next step is to emphasize integrity. As I said, as I mentioned in the last bullet, I think there's no room for error when you're starting anything, but especially when you're working with kids. So initially, out of the gate, we had a lot of opportunities. We had a lot of people coming to us with opportunities to collaborate. And initially, that was very flattering. I mean, it was kind of like, well, you really, okay, you're accepting me. You like this program. This is great. But they weren't necessarily the best fit for the program. And we had to, as a team, get together and reevaluate our core values. Now, one of the ways as we started to grow and we were, um, we expanded into the Boys and Girls Club, we just expanded into Detroit Public Schools, we expanded to communities and schools in um, Raleigh, North Carolina. We realized it would be very easy to lose control of the program. And I didn't want someone, a volunteer, and our volunteers are tremendous and very well-intentioned, but I didn't want someone to go and just hang out with the kids for an hour and say they'd done the Work It Out program. So we created what we call the one-hour formula. And this is the foundation for every one of our sessions. And our sessions usually last 12 weeks. Um, and the intent of the one-hour formula was twofold. First of all, it gave the kids a very safe structure to thrive in. And I'm sure any, everyone here who has kids understands that kids really do thrive in structure. So by providing them this one-hour formula, every time they come to one of our programs, they understand there's going to be an introduction, an overview of what we're doing that day. We're going to talk about nutrition. There's going to be an activity. There's going to be a relaxation. And then there's going to be a recap. And the kids really, really liked it. They were thriving, in fact. The second part of the one-hour formula was that it gave us a means to control the program as we grew. Like I said, as we went into the Boys and Girls Club, as we started partnering with the public school system and communities and schools, it gave us a means to really have a handle on exactly what was being executed. Um, as I said, we have a tremendous amount of our tremendous group of volunteers. And we appreciate them, we value them, but we also understand that they want to feel safe in their commitment to us. So we go through a training process once a year, and every volunteer signs a document and commits to following the one-hour formula. And they, they really like it. They knew exactly what to do. We're not just throwing them into an environment where it's chaos. It was safe for them, it's safe for the kids, and they're just thriving. My next E is enthusiasm. And as you can see, you know, I have passion for this topic. And you know, I think in life, our, everything is always changing. It's evolving. Since I started the program six years ago in my own life, I've been appointed um, by the governor to a public role. You know, I had two kids. I um, ran for public office. I had a lot of changes. But I had a commitment to the program. I had a responsibility. And it was important for me to step back and reassess and keep focused. I have a responsibility to lead this program. And I know there are things that I can do that will get me worked up again. I know if I start reading articles, I'm going to get worked up. I know if I see the kids in the program, I'm going to get excited and I'm going to find their passion to be contagious for me. So the enthusiasm, I think, in anything that we do is very important. It's important as we get distracted and as life comes at us to just keep stepping back and reevaluating. And the, the K is to keep focused. So we, of course, always have our objectives, we have our goals, we're moving forward, but our top focus is to connect 
with the kids. That was always our number one priority, is to work with them, as I said, from the inside out, to equip them with the tools to make healthy choices. And while we can have all sorts of grand ideas of what's going to resonate and what we can do and how we connect, can connect with them, what we found is if we just listen to them, they were actually telling us what resonated. And one of the areas that they were thriving in was the yoga. And it was kind of much to our surprise. We started introducing a lot of activities. We tried hockey, we tried tennis, and you know, to be perfectly honest, we were working with kids in the inner city, so while I was kind of hoping to find the next great hockey player or the next great athlete, it wasn't realistic to present them with an activity that they couldn't financially pursue. It would be very difficult anyway. Um, someone said, well, can't you encourage them to run? Just go run around the block. And it wasn't just that we had obstacles in the terms of the kids didn't have good running shoes or gangs, but they also had a lot of obstacles with stray dogs in the neighborhood. So the kids we were working with couldn't just go out and run. So the area that they loved the most was the yoga. And we were thrilled, but we were kind of surprised. We were a little hesitant. Someone said, um, you know, aren't the kids adverse to doing a yuppie-based activity? Well, we were dealing with kids in the inner city. They didn't know what that meant. And I was watching, in fact, at an end of session presentation at the Boys and Girls Club. We were in a pretty rough part of Detroit. And um, there were three girls that were going up to present their, what they had learned in yoga to the entire gymnasium. And these girls were pretty tough. And they kind of like, you know, walked up and they were tough and they were looking at all the kids like, you know, you better not laugh at me. And they got up in front of everyone and when it was time to begin the yoga, they were able to become perfectly still. And we all got tears in our eyes. We thought, you know what, we get it. These kids live with tremendous amounts of stress. I mean, we all live with stress. But these kids live with an immense amount of stress that they can't even articulate. And in fact, I think at times they can't articulate the stress they live with because they don't know anything else. It's just their reality. And I thought, okay, you guys are pretty darn clever because what you told us was that you loved having this time, this safe environment, this one hour formula. Your mat was your safe ground. They understand when they come to us, they're going to be okay. There's not going to be a lot of chaos. They can just breathe, they can be still, and they can feel good about themselves. So we listened. And um, about two and a half years ago, we switched the program. And rather than introducing a different activity every week through the 12 weeks, we just focused on yoga. So now every week has a theme. Um, one week might be power. So we'll teach them about power foods, and then we'll teach them power yoga moves. So um, I can go on and on telling you how tremendous the kids are, but it's kind of cool to hear it in their own words. Now, what I like about yoga is that it relaxes you after you had a hard day. Yoga is very relaxing to me, and it makes me calm down to all the things that happen at school. Sometimes after recess, I really get frustrated and stuff, and then the yoga classes just calm me down. Sometimes we got to play games like uh, Simon says what we had to do, yoga poses. When we did all those kind of poses, my favorite one was the bridge, um, like the cobra. I would say the tree pose. Another game that I liked was yoga freeze tag. It's like tag, but if you do a yoga pose, then they can't catch you. One person would be it and you run around. Then, um, then like if you did a yoga pose, they couldn't get you while you're in that yoga pose. So I am Malcolm does a yoga pose. Malcolm do a yoga pose. And, and I touch him like that, that means he's still in. Sometimes I, when I get home, I do yoga myself with my mom and my brother. You can teach it to the people you know. I've taught my mom and my grandma and most of my family. I tell them if they tried and they failed, just keep trying. I tell them about how like it's so relaxing and even taught them a little bit of the poses. I've learned that to um, stay healthy, you have to eat healthy. Healthy eating is very important in your life. You eat like a bunch of foods that are all different colors. You can build body and mind. And I always eat green foods. Greens, vegetables, 
like healthy eating is good for you and the more you do it like the better your body will become i learned that you should try different types of food you should eat healthy because it'll make you big and strong. If you do it more and more each day, then like eventually you'll be like addicted to healthy eating. I felt um, sort of proud for doing my for my body, giving the effort of doing this class. Now I'm gonna be really healthy, but with all the lessons that we did, and it was a good idea to bring it to the school. They're just so cute. I just love them. I love them. And you know, part of what's so cool about this program and the way it's evolved is that they've all become ambassadors. So they really take what they've learned and they take it back into their homes and their communities. We found a contagious enthusiasm where siblings and cousins and friends are now coming to the program. And it's just, it's beyond anything we could have hoped, which is great because going back to my original intent with, with the program, when I was creating it, I always wanted it to be bigger than me. I always wanted it to outgrow me. I thought this was such, such a critical, critical topic. You know, not only is this the first generation, as we saw earlier, that's going to outlive their parents, but you know, when you think about the health care costs that we're going to incur in 5, 10, 15 years from preventable cancers, heart disease, and diabetes that were caused by childhood obesity, it's really, it's maddening, but I don't think it's an impossible situation. I think we can get to the root of it, and I think we can work with the kids just one at a time. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate to be standing here with all of you, and, but... Um, you know, I'm also humbled because I'm not a hero. It was just an idea, and I said, let's do something about it. And I think anyone can do something about it. And now um, we've worked with thousands of kids, and the evaluation has been over 90% highly, effect highly effective. So the kids have told us that they love it, they keep coming back. As I said, they bring their family and friends. So, um, I think the future is bright. We have more goals. I've started working on a series of children's books that I'd love to, at some point, maybe donate, get back, get into the schools, um, because they don't have any sort of a phys ed program that they're offering the kids. You know, we'd love to do a documentary. We'd love to do videos. So um, maybe at some point, making the program for profit. Um, so we keep moving forward. We keep growing. We have visions. We collaborate. Um, we, we do what we believe is right for the program, but the most important part of this is we never stop listening to the kids. So, you know, I prepared this presentation to kind of talk about um, my experience and the steps that I used to f create the foundation of the program. But I thought I'd kind of tack in onto the end um, just a few things that are my own personal mantra for good karma. Karma's actually in my name, so... Um, it's what I live by. The first is to follow your guts, which, you know, we all know, we all hear, we're all told to do it, and we just don't do it enough. So the next step is to be aware. I think in all areas of our life, just be aware. For me, it was just being aware of this epidemic that wasn't quite, quite topical yet. You know, just before I came out here, I was telling someone that in the last five or six years, there have been so many more programs that have been developed to battle this epidemic. And I think that's a really good thing. You know, I don't feel competitive because we're fighting for funds or grants. I think it's a really, really good thing. The more people involved, the more people who have ideas to fight this problem, I, I think it's the greatest thing in the world. The next step is to give back. You know, for some people it's time, for some people it's resources, or for some people it's ideas. You know, not everybody has the means to write a check to a nonprofit, but sometimes the best thing you can do to give back is just offer your ideas. You know, we've grown the program exponentially just based on volunteers who have given us their ideas and led us in ways we never would have thought of. And that in some ways has been more valuable than just writing a check. And the last one is to be well. And whatever that means to you, if it's eating healthy, exercise, yoga, taking time to be still, be well. So thank you for having me here today.